As you can see, we're going to be continuing our Bible book overview series of going through books of the Bible and just overviewing them. And we come to tonight to the book of Esther. Uh, this is a book that I'm sure everybody loves. It's a wonderful book. It's an incredible book. There's so much that's within the book, a lot more than we'll be able to really talk about and delve into in just an overview study. But I hope that what we do have to go through together this evening will be helpful, that it will maybe give you a foundation to go and do some further reading and study in this great book on your own. And so we'll just jump right into this overview of the book of Esther. And these first few slides we'll go through pretty quick because we've gone through these a couple of times already. Just a reminder that in the eras, there's several eras throughout the Old Testament history that really cover the entirety of the Old Testament. And we've gone through all of these books except for First and Second Chronicles. We'll probably come back to them sometime later. Uh, but we've gone through all of these books and we're now in what you might call the return era This is or the post-exilic era. This is after the captivity of the nation of Judah by Babylon. And it's when they have been allowed to return to Jerusalem. Now, as you recall, when we talked about Ezra and Nehemiah, um, that is done in a couple of waves, and not everybody chooses to go back to Jerusalem. And there were probably various reasons for that. But we're now in the book of Esther. We'll talk about the timeline in, in a moment, but it's the third of three historical books that take place during this return or post exilic. Aaron. So when we finish with Esther tonight, again, other than First and Second Chronicles, we will have finished all of the historical books of the Old Testament. Um, we'll go through this very quickly. Just a reminder, this is where we're at historically. These are the names of the kings that we're dealing with when we're talking about Israel or Judah uh, and Babylon. The, main, the only one we're going to be dealing with tonight is this one here, Ahasuerus. His, that's the Hebrew name. His name is also Xerxes. And throughout the lesson, I'm going to be referring to him as Xerxes because that's what most people recognize him as. And it's a whole lot easier to say than Ahasuerus. So they're one and the same. It's a Hebrew name and a Greek name. But this is who we'll be speaking about, a prominent character in the story of Esther. Now, timeline, and I think this helps... Uh, to understand because when we just read through our, our Bibles as they're ordered, we come to Ezra and then Nehemiah and then the book of Esther, but historically Esther actually fits in between those. In fact, sh the story of Esther takes place in between chapter 6 of Ezra and chapter 7 of Ezra. If you remember the history, uh, back in 608 BC, Nebuchadnezzar had carried away the first wave of exiles from Jerusalem. There were a couple of more deportations after that. Uh, then it is in 538 BC, uh, the year before Cyrus had conquered Babylon and the Medo-Persian Empire becomes the world power. And in 538 BC, exactly 70 years after the first deportation, Cyrus decrees that any Jews wishing to return to Jerusalem can. And Zerubbabel leads that first wave of returnees back to Jerusalem. And that is told in the first six chapters of Ezra about Zerubbabel leading that first wave, laying the foundation of the temple. There's some years that go by and they have to be encouraged to finish the building and the temple is finished in 516 B.C. And so we have quite a bit of time, even between that and the events of Esther. Uh, Xerxes becomes king in 486. The nice thing about this part of the Bible is uh, these are pretty... Um, accurate dates. We can historically figure these out pretty easily. And the book of Esther has all sorts of, ra of dates in there, so we know when things happen. Uh, so Xerxes becomes king of Persia in 486 BC. The events of Esther pick up in the third year of his reign. So the events of Esther start in 483 BC, and they cover a period of 10 years. Uh, and then it's sometime later, about 15 years later, that Ezra chapter 7 begins with the second wave of returnees that's led by Ezra from Babylon or Persia to Jerusalem. And so this is where we're at historically with the story of Esther. Now, the geography, uh, we'll go through this very quickly. This represents the Persian Empire. It was a massive empire. It was the largest empire uh, in world history to this point as far as how much territory it covered. And the story, I know you can't probably read all of these little words on here, but right there is the city of Susa. And during the life of Esther, that is the capital city of the Persian Empire. And so, in fact, if you that picture that was on the... Uh, the 
first title slide. That's an actual picture, I believe, of uh, the city of Susa. Uh, it's in Iran, so it's not an easy tourist destination, but you can visit the city of Susa and some of its uh, remains to this day, I believe. But here is the capital city of Susa, and all of the book of Esther takes place here. Now, the book itself, the title and author of this book, we've gone over this with some of the books. The title obviously is named after the main character, uh, that is Queen Esther. Now, we say that she's the main character. There's a good case to be made that uh, her uncle or cousin Mordecai is really as much of a focus as she is. They kind of together become the main focal point of this story, but the book bears her name, making it only uh, one of two books in the Bible that are named after a woman. Of course, the other one being the book of Ruth. As to who wrote the book, there's no claim. Nobody cla there's no, it's an anonymous writing. There's no author claimed within the book. There's a lot of theories and ideas. Uh, Mordecai is one of the primary um, suggestions that he would be the one most familiar with the story, and so it makes sense that maybe he wrote it, perhaps Ezra or Nehemiah, as they wrote some of the later books, and they came not too long after these events. Perhaps they were informed of these things. Whoever it was, there's a lot of uh, specific detail about dates. There's a lot of details about names. There's a lot of details about the palace itself. In fact, there are things in the book of Esther that have been proven uh, that the the author knew about the palace and its precincts and its grounds from archaeological discoveries. And so whoever wrote the book was very, very familiar with, obviously they were inspired, but they were very familiar with the Persian court and with the individuals and the leadership. So again, someone like Mordecai or Nehemiah, who later would, was a cupbearer to the king, um, would make a lot of sense. But at the end of the day, we don't know specifically. Now, something that's very interesting about the book of Esther, something that's very odd even, is when you read this book, there is no mention from chapter 1 through chapter 10 of God. God's name never appears in any of its form. We just got through with the series of the titles and descriptions of God. Not a, one of them show up in the book of Esther. There's no direct reference to God in this book. In fact, it goes a little bit further than that. It's kind of a strange book. There is no reference to the law of Moses. There's no reference to the covenant. Prayer is never specifically mentioned. There is fasting that is mentioned, and in the rest of the Scripture, prayer always goes with fasting, but it's not mentioned directly. There's no Hebrew heroes mentioned. There's no mention of Abraham or Moses or David or any of the other typical characters that you might find in one of the writings of Scripture. And so it's a very strange book because all of the hallmarks of an Old Testament book uh, of a Hebrew book don't really seem to be there. And so some have actually debated whether this book belongs in the Bible. This is probably the most debated book, at least of the Old Testament, of whether it belongs in the Bible or not. Now, I think it does. We won't get into all of that right now. We're just going to assume that it does, and I think that it does. But if it does, then why is God not in the book? Why is he not mentioned? Why are we not told about him? Why are we not told about any of the other things that tend to go along with Hebrew history? Well, keep that in the back of your mind as we talk through this book, and we'll circle back to that hopefully by the end of our lesson. Now, a simple outline of the book of Esther. It seems to be following a lot of the others. I've feel like I've broken up about every book we've gone through lately into two main sections, and the book of Esther is the same. The first four chapters deal with the threat to the Jewish people. We'll talk about that threat, Haman's plot. There is a threat to destroy, to completely annihilate. An individual tries and seems to get pretty close to being able to commit genocide against the Jewish people. And the first four chapters give us the setting and the background and what leads up to that and the plot uh, itself. But then the last half of the book, chapters 5 through 10, cover how things actually work out and how uh, Esther and her uncle Mordecai are able to overcome Haman and his evil plots and how not only they overcome personally, but the entire nation, the entire people of the Jews are able to triumph over their enemies and a celebration that is born 
from that victory. And so let's just go through chapter by chapter of this section and the wonderful story of Esther. Now, chapter 1 gives us the background as to why these events take place, as to how Esther becomes queen in the first place. And what happens is, as we read, we read about King Xerxes, and in his third year of his reign, he throws a massive celebration. In fact, the Bible says that he threw a 180-day feast. I want you to think about it. that's That's half a year, roughly. So for half a year, King Xerxes throws a party for his nation, and there is feasting, and there is celebrating. And you can imagine all the types of things that went on across the empire, especially in the capital city, as he throws this feast. And when that feast finally winds down, because 180 days is not a long enough party, he decides to throw another week-long feast. He has a seven-day-long feast at the end of that. And at, as he's hosting the seven-day feast for all of his nobles and princes, his his queen, Queen Vashti, we're told, is hosting a feast in the palace for the women. Well, as this feast is going along, I believe it's about the third day uh, or so along in the feast, uh, Xerxes, who we are told is well drunk with wine, so basically he's drunk by this point in the festival, and he's having a good time with his buddies and friends and nobles, and he gets the idea that he wants to show off his bride. Vashti was apparently a beautiful woman, and she was pleasant to look upon, and so he sends some of his servants to Queen Vashti and tells her to come wearing her royal crown, so she's supposed to be wearing her crown, and present herself in all of her beauty for for the men to be able to look on and for all the peoples to be able to see. It says that they, uh, um, for her to show the peoples and princes her beauty. Now, how much to read into that? Exactly what King Xerxes was asking for. The Bible doesn't say all of the details. There's a lot of speculation of what this actually meant and what he's wanting her to do. And without reading into that, we can tell this is a very base request. And Vashti refuses. Now, he's the king of the world, and she will not come. Now, why she won't come, we're not specifically told. There's, again, a lot of theories and ideas. Uh, maybe she was too modest. That is a nice thing to try and think of. Maybe she didn't like her husband. Maybe she just didn't like being told what to do. We're not told the reason, but she would not go along with this base request, this base command of the king to come and parade herself for the gawking eyes of the princes and the nobles and the peoples. And so she will not go. Well, when that happens... Of course, Xerxes is irate, and history shows Xerxes was, he was kind of a piece of work. He was known for a temper. Um, he's one who, uh, at one point in history, his engineers tried to build a bridge across the Hellespont, and a, a massive storm blew it down, and so he just beheaded all of the engineers, and he hired a whole new group of engineers to build him a bridge. That was pretty common for Xerxes, things like that. So he is irate at this point. And he's not the only one that's upset. His nobles are pretty upset too. And if you read through chapter 1, their concern is that if news gets out that Vashti had denied the king's command, and that's going to give ideas to all of the other women in the land. And all of the women, it says that they're worried that all of the women will sh look at their husbands in contempt. And they can't have that. They can't have all these women giving, uh, acting contemptuously and disobediently towards their husband. And so they decide that Vashti must be removed as queen. And it says banished. Some people think she was probably executed. It doesn't say specifically that she was. If she was, it wouldn't have been out of character or out of line for Xerxes to do something like that. I'd like to think that because she had denied him uh, and actually and showed some form of goodness, hopefully, that she was at least spared, but she's banished. She's no longer allowed into the presence of the king. The crown is removed from her head, and just like that, King Xerxes no longer has a queen. And the final verse of uh, chapter 1 is interesting. There's a proclamation that goes throughout the land explaining why Vashti is removed. And it says that every man should be master in his own household. And that seems like a little bit of irony. And there's a lot of irony. The, the, the writer of Esther is a master 
at telling a story. And there's irony all throughout the book. And this is one of those, this proclamation goes out, and when you look at it, it's quite clear that the king of the world didn't even have the ability to practice complete authority in his own home. His own wife rejected and refused his command, even though he has absolute power over the world. And that's just a slight nod to the fact that Xerxes, for being the king of the world, is not the one who is in charge. Even when God seems to be absent from this story, there is a greater hand at work in all of these things. Now that story is important because it tells us the opening. Why is there an opening for the queen of Persia? Well, chapter 2 talks about that a little bit. As we know why Vashti is no longer queen, some time goes by, and in fact I believe it's about three years if I remember my dates correctly, uh, through the text, but some time has gone by, and Xerxes is wanting a queen again. In fact, history, even, there's even some historical documents that mention he has suffered in these intervening years. Xerxes has suffered a pretty big defeat from uh, the Greeks when he tried to attack them, and history even mentions that he sought solace um, in his harem which would fit about the timeline that these events take place. And so the advisors to the king, he's wanting a queen again, and what they decide to do is to look throughout the entire empire. There's 127 provinces throughout the empire, and they're going to look through the entire empire, and they're going to find the most beautiful young women who are virgins that they can, and they're going to bring them from all across the empire. And they put these young women through 12 months of beautifying. They send them through education. They teach them basically how to do makeup. They, t they use oils and perfumes. And they spend 12 months making these women even more beautiful and training them to basically be a part of the king's harem, to be a concubine, and for one of them to be able, if they please the king, to become the queen of the empire. Now... We're told and introduced here to a man named Mordecai. And we're told that this is a Jew. He is a Jew. Uh, it says that he was carried off in the deportation. That may be just meaning that his family was carried off in the deportation. If he himself was carried off in the deportation, he'd be over 100 years old uh, when these events take place. That's probably not uh, the case. It's probably just a reference to uh, his family was specifically carried off in the first deportation uh, of Nebuchadnezzar. But Mordecai is a Jew, and we're even told his tribe, he is the tribe of Benjamin and a descendant of Kish. Now that's a name that you've probably heard of because that is the father of the first king, Saul. Remember, Saul was the son of Kish. And so this man may not be a direct descendant of Saul, but he is a relative. He's a direct descendant of Saul's uh, father. And that plays an important role, or an interesting role at least, here in a little while. So keep that in the back of your mind. But anyway, Mordecai is introduced as well as his niece. We're told that his, or his cousin, his uncle's daughter is Esther. Her Hebrew name is Hadessa. Her, her Persian name would have been Esther. And she had lost her parents. We're not told the details, but her parents had both died. And so Mordecai raised this girl who was his cousin, younger than him. He had raised her as his own daughter. And so she had been orphaned, but she had been raised by Mordecai. And the Bible describes her as a woman who was had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. That's the Bible's description of this woman. So she is a beautiful woman. And as these individuals start going throughout the empire to look for beautiful women, of course they find Esther. And she is taken off, and uh, she is from the capital city probably. Mordecai lives there in the capital city. And every day Mordecai goes, and he checks on Esther, and he sees how she's doing. And he probably advises her and helps her. And, of course, she does very well. She is pleasing in the eyes of the eunuchs who are in charge of the harem, who are in charge of beautifying these women and training these women. And she prospers there. And again, it never specifically says that she's prospered by God, but you can kind of see again God working behind the scenes as she, of all of the women of this vast empire, uh, kind of rises in the ranks. And ultimately, the time comes when it is her turn to go into King Xerxes. Again, the Bible is very silent about that. You can read between the lines. There's a lot of debate about that and about the morality and the ethics of that. We won't get into all of that. 
We'll just simply accept what the Bible says. She went in to the king, and we're told that she pleased. he found her more pleasing. Uh, she found grace in his eyes. And of all of these women, King Xerxes chooses Esther to be his bride and to become the queen of Persia. And so she is made the queen. There's another feast that's thrown in her honor. And now she is the queen. Now Mordecai has given her some advice. He has told her through this process, do not tell the eunuchs or the king who you are as far as your people. And so she is a Jew, but Persia is an empire that at this point is so mingled with people that they don't even recognize one another from their natural descent. Uh, they don't even know that she is a Jew just by looking at her. And so she's able to kind of fly under the radar. Now, why would Mordecai do that? Well, there's probably a lot of animosity. We'll see one man who truly hates the Jews. But the Jews always kind of had a hard time uh, in Assyrian captivity and Babylonian captivity because they were monotheistic. They believed in the one true God of Israel. And Persia was very big on inclusiveness. Does that sound very familiar to anybody? And they wanted everybody to kind of accept everything. And so they wanted to honor all of these religions and all of these ideas. And they thought that is what brought peace. And so a group of people that looked at Gentiles as unclean people, a group of people that didn't not only didn't worship other gods, but said they were false gods. That's a group of people that begins to make people upset and uncomfortable. And so uh, there's a lot of animosity typically towards the Jewish people. So perhaps that's why Mordecai tells um, Esther at the beginning to keep her identity hidden. So she's the queen, and this opens up an opportunity for a very uh, important moment. Mordecai, whatever his position is, so one day overhears a plot. This is at the very end of chapter 2. He discovers a plot against King Xerxes. There's some eunuchs that are upset and mad about something Xerxes has done. And they're so mad that they plan on assassinating the king. But Mordecai hears this and he goes and he tells Esther. And Esther goes and she informs the king. And the king has an, makes an inquiry and they look into the incident and find out it was true. And they execute those two men. And it's written, we're told, in the Chronicles of the King that Mordecai had uncovered this plot, and then it just ends. That's, again, one of those foreshadowing elements that's going to come back to play. Then, when we get to chapter 3, we come to the villain of the story. We're introduced to a man named Haman. Now, Haman is said to be an Agagite. And I think what that means, what many commentators think it means, is he is a descendant of Agag. That's another name that we should remember. Agag was the Amalekite king that King Saul was told to annihilate and to kill. And the king that Saul did not kill. Now Samuel did ultimately kill Agag, but it seems very likely that some of his family, some of his descendants apparently survived. Because here we have again an Agagite, one of the arch enemies of God's people. And it's interesting that now you have Mordecai, a descendant of Kish, the father of Saul, at odds with an Agagite. It's like Saul and Agag all over again. But this time, Mordecai is going to win. And the line of Agag is going to be completely and finally cut off. Well, Agag, or this Haman, however, he's a favored official in the court of Xerxes. And we're told that he was promoted. He was placed over all of the other officials. Basically, he is second in command in the entire kingdom. And the king even makes an order that the others, the other servants of the king, the other officials, should bow and pay homage to Haman. But Mordecai would never do that. Mordecai would never actually bow to this man. And Mordecai would not pay homage and obeisance to this man. Because he was a man. Let's read verses 3 through 6. It says, the other people start seeing this and noticing this. It says, then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day and he would not listen to them, they told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. 
And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury, but he disdained to lay his hands on Mordecai alone. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. So Mordecai will not bow down to, Mor um, to Haman when he walks through or when he comes by. And some people see this. And they begin asking, they say, Mordecai, this is a command from the king. Why are you disobeying the king? And apparently his answer was, I'm not going to do that. I'm a Jew. Now that's the way it's put in the text here. But what did that mean? Why would a Jew not bow down to this man? Because they believe in the one true God of Israel. And because they believe that no one, deserves to be bowed down to and basically shown that type of reverence and that type of worship except God alone. Much like three other men that we read about back in the time of Nebuchadnezzar, Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, who would not bow down when the music played to the, the idol that Nebuchadnezzar had built. They would rather be thrown into a fiery furnace than to bow down to a man or to the to an image. And that's what Mordecai say. He's not going to bow down. And so these people, they finally go and they tell Mordecai. Now, there's something interesting. This is another one of those pieces of information. I know there's a lot of them through here, but you want to keep in the back of your mind. Notice why they do this. It says they wanted to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. What does that mean? Well, Hopefully we'll see as we go throughout the rest of the book. But they want to see if this man has a reason for his confidence in disobeying the law of the king. By the way, this is one of the important features of the book of Esther. Why is the book of Esther in the Bible? It's a very interesting tale, but why is it in the Bible? One of the reasons it's in here is it teaches God's people how to act in a civilization, in a society, in a world that is contrary to God's plan. How were the Jews living in Susa, living in Babylon, living in, in Persia, living throughout the world, no longer in the confines of Jerusalem, surrounded by like-minded Jewish people, but instead surrounded by pagans and idolaters? How were they supposed to act? The easy way to act would be to conform or to compromise. I mean, Mordecai could have very easily have said, hey, this is a command from the king, and I mean, I still know that God is the all-powerful, one true God, but I also need to obey the king, and so I'm going to bow down and pay homage to Mordecai or to Haman. But he didn't do that. He didn't take that easy route. Instead, he made himself a target, and ultimately, his people a target. Haman is an arrogant, selfish man, a very proud man, and he's so infuriated when he finds out that Mordecai won't bow down to him, and he learns that Mordecai is a Jew, and he probably has some of these animosities towards Jews anyway, and so he decides, you know, he's the second in command now. He's a powerful, powerful man. So he's going to erase the problem. He's not just going to kill Mordecai. He's going to wipe Mordecai's people off the face of the earth. He is going to annihilate them. He's going to commit genocide. And the way that they do this, the... the cavalier way that they do this. We're told that they cast lots, and the word for lots there is per. And again, that's one of those things that's going to come up at the end of the story. And they decide upon what month that they'll kill all the Jews. And they cast lots to determine the day. This all takes place in the first month of the year. And the lots fall on the 13th day of the 12th month. So 11 months from now, Haman wants to destroy all of the Jews. So he goes before King Xerxes and he bribes him. He basically he offers him 10,000 talents of his own money to help see this through. He tells uh, Xerxes that there's this group of people that are disobedient to the king and that they don't listen to the king. That wasn't true at all. The people were, the, the Jews that were, uh, they typically were good people and they were obedient. Now, when it came to things like bowing down to Mordecai, they weren't. But look back at men like Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, look forward to men like Nehemiah. They were wonderful servants to the kingdom. And so this was a lie when he said that they were problem and problems and rebellious. But he tells Xerxes all these things and he says, so you need to just wipe them out. And Xerxes, being the ruler that he was, says, okay, 
That sounds like a good plan. Take care of it. I mean, that's the type of man Xerxes was. He would sign off on a, an, on a genocide of an entire people that were supposed to be his subjects. And so Haman thinks that he's got this all down. He thinks that this is going to be great. And notice verse the end of verse 15, or the, verse 15 says, The couriers went out hurriedly by order of the king, and decree was issued in Susa the citadel. And the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. There's an interesting thing that happens over and over throughout the book. It really focuses on food. We start with a 180-day festival and another seven-day feast, and that leads to disaster. And then we, we read about Haman and King Xerxes making plans to annihilate an entire group of people, and when they're done with that, they sit down to drink as if everything's just perfectly fine. There's other feasts in, the, in, in this story and the very first thing we find when we turn to chapter 4, Mordecai finds out and he puts on sackcloth and ashes and he tears his clothes and he begins fasting. So in comparison with all of these celebrations, with Haman and Xerxes who are drinking and eating, we now turn to Mordecai and the Jewish people who are terrified, understandably. An issue or an order has gone out. And what that order, that edict said, was that on the 13th day of the 12th month, anybody who wanted to could rise up and kill their Jewish neighbors. And the edict specifically said that they could annihilate, destroy, kill them, including women and children, and they could plunder all their goods. I want you to imagine living anywhere in this empire of Persia, and you're a Jew, and all of a sudden, this messenger from the capital comes into town and posts up some bulletin. And you read it, and it says that in 11 months, anybody that doesn't like you, anybody that hates you, anybody that wants your stuff, they will legally be allowed in 11 months to kill you, to kill your wife, to kill your children, and to take anything that you possess. And there's nothing that you can do about it. And that's the, the situation of the Jewish people at this point. Well, Mordecai is, or, or is devastated. The Jewish people are devastated. And so he goes to Esther. He sends a messenger to Esther. And she gets very nervous because he comes in sackcloth. And you're not allowed to come into the king's palace with sackcloth. But there's Mordecai at the gates, and she sends messengers asking why he's doing this, and he sends a copy of this edict. Apparently she hadn't seen or heard of it quite yet. And he begs Esther, he says, please intercede for us. Let the king know who you are. See what can be done. But Esther's worried about doing this. Now we might think, why in the world would she be worried about this? These are her people. But this is not an easy thing to ask of her. This is dangerous. See, she says that for 30 days, the king has not called upon her. For a month, her husband has not come to see her or called her to come see him. She's been ignored for a month. But the king like Xerxes, there's a good chance that means that you're losing favor, that he's turned his attention elsewhere. And if you make him upset, the consequences could be dire. And what Mordecai is asking her to do is proactively go into his presence. And that's illegal. You are not allowed to approach King Xerxes without an invitation. And if you do so, and he gets upset, he can have you executed on the spot. Even if you're Queen Esther. But listen, surely the most well-known passage of this great book it says, they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think that to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have cannot come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf, and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Well, notice Mordecai's faith. Mordecai is begging 
Esther to do what she can. But he has faith that even if she won't, he says relief will rise from another place. Where's that other place? Well, clearly that's God. He knows that God will not leave his people to annihilation. But that doesn't mean that those who have opportunity to do what they can have an easy way out. If she neglects to do what she can with the privilege she has been afforded, he says there will be great judgment for you. But he asks her, he says, perhaps it could be that you have been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. One commentator I read said, God's favor is never meant to be squandered in selfish indulgence. What an amazing thought. Surely there were many times when the orphan refugee laid in the queen's chambers wondering how she had had such good fortune. How she had become queen of the empire. After all she had lived through, how could she have been so blessed? And then one day, she finds out. She has been greatly blessed, but with that great blessing has come an awesome responsibility and an awesome opportunity. And we don't know all the reasons we have the blessings that we do, but whenever we have opportunity to use the blessings and the opportunities and the privileges that God has given us, it is incumbent upon us to do so for the good of his kingdom. So she asks, she goes ahead and says, I will do this. She asks Mordecai and all the Jews to feast or to fast for three days. No water, no food. This is a very serious thing. And she will do the same. And notice her resolve. We've seen Mordecai's faith. We see her courage. She says, I will go before the king and if I perish, I perish. If her people perish, it will not be because she sat by in cowardice. What a wonderful attitude to go into the face of danger, willing to do what's right, whatever the consequences. When we come to the then chapters 5 through 7, tell of Haman's demise. And uh, Esther approaches Xerxes after this fast is over, and she comes into his throne room. And this is the moment of truth. What is Xerxes going to do? Is he going to be in a bad mood? Is he going to be mad? But we're told that when he sees her, she finds favor in his sight, and he extends the golden scepter. He has this golden scepter in his hand, and that is the sign of acceptance. When he extends that scepter, it means she is allowed to come into his presence. He is not going to be angry with her. He is not going to banish her or kill her. He is going to invite her to speak with him, and he does much more than that. He says he's very pleased when he sees his wife. Now why he hasn't gone and seen her for 30 days, it's Xerxes. We can't know the man's mind. But now he sees her and he's overjoyed to see her. And he says, what's your request? And much similar to another man we read of in the Bible, he says, you can have what you want up to half my kingdom. But she has a very simple request. She says, I don't want that. Instead, just come by my place Tomorrow, I want you and Haman to come to a banquet, or that, that day actually, to a banquet that I've prepared for you. So he gathers Haman, and they go, and they have this banquet, and during the banquet, Xerxes asks again, he says, okay, what's all this about? What do you want? I'll give it to you, up to half my kingdom. And she says, this is what I want. I want tomorrow for you and Haman to come back again to another banquet, and then I'll tell you what I really want. Well, by this point, Haman is overjoyed. You know, things are going as well as they possibly could. There's plans in place to kill his enemies. He's being shown favor by not only Xerxes, but by the queen. But on the way home, he sees Mordecai. And it just, he's one of those people that everything can be going right. And just seeing somebody that annoys him ruins his day. And he's furious. So when he gets home, he decides what he's going to do. It says that he uh, erects a 75-foot gallows. And he's going to kill Mordecai. He's going to put Mordecai to death. Now, when we read gallows, we think of uh, a, a rope and a noose. That may have been what he built. But based on historical evidence, what this likely was, a common way of executing people and displaying them was basically this would have been a sharpened stick that they would have probably impaled someone on. Now, they may, it may have been a form of crucifixion. It may have been a hanging or it may have been an impaling. But whatever it was, it would have been gruesome. And 75 feet is meant for the entire city to see. This is going to be a public display of Haman's overcoming his enemies. Well, that's the plan. But chapter 6, we find that that night Xerxes can't sleep. 
For some reason, sleep eludes him. And so he does uh, what some people do. He wants to be read to. Now, he's the king, so he doesn't have to do his own reading. He has someone read to him, and he has them read the official records of the king. So they pick some section in the Chronicles of the Kings to read to Xerxes. And guess what section they read about? It just so happens on this very night, the night before Haman's going to come question King Xerxes about putting Mordecai to death. The king can't sleep, and his servant reads to him about a few years ago when there was a plot against the king's life. And a servant named Mordecai had informed Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king, and his life was spared. Now, Xerxes, hearing this story, he, he remembers the event, but then he thinks about what happened, and he asks, did this man Mordecai ever get rewarded? Did we ever reward this man for his service? And the servants say, no, nothing was ever done for Mordecai. By this point, it's early morning, and Haman has come to the castle. Haman has come to the palace, and they say, Haman's here, and Haman walks in, and the Bible says he's there to ask about putting Mordecai to death. Now, 24 hours earlier, Xerxes may have given that request to him, but this morning, before Haman can say a word, Xerxes says, Haman, I've got a question for you. What should be done for the man that the king wants to honor? Well, Haman, in his arrogance, thinks, who else would the king honor but me? I'm the favored in this court. And so what does Haman do? He answers what he thinks would be great to experience. And he says, let the king give the man one of his robes that he's worn. And let this man sit on a horse that the king has sat on. And let one of the nobles ride, parade this man through the streets of the city, saying, thus it is done to the man that the king wants to honor. And Xerxes says, that's a fantastic idea. I love the idea, and I want you to do it. I want you to go and do everything you've said. Don't leave a single bit of it out, and I want you to go do that for Mordecai. All the, there's so many events in history that you'd love to see. Wouldn't you love to have seen Haman's face when he heard that name? And Haman has to leave the courtyard and he takes one of the king's royal robes and one of the king's horses and he puts the robe on his enemy Mordecai and he places him up on the horse and Haman has to parade this man. There's a gallows that's standing somewhere in the city that's probably visible that's meant for Mordecai. And everybody knows Haman's built it and here's Haman parading Mordecai through the city praising him in the name of the king. Well, this gets done Haman returns home in mourning. Now his wife says something interesting in verse 13. She says, If Mordecai before whom you have begun to fall is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. I don't know why she didn't give him that sage bit of advice before he started building the gallows. But by this point, she's realized there's something, there's an undertone of this story. The people know there's something different about the Jewish people. Well, chapter 7 comes. Haman's day is awful, but at least he gets to go to the banquet. At least he's going to this favored uh, feast that the queen is throwing for him. And while they are there and they're eating, the king asks her again, what's all this about? And she tells him. And she says in a very diplomatic, wonderful way that he is getting ready to destroy a people unjustly. She says, if, if you were just selling off my people to slavery. I wouldn't say a thing. But you're about to destroy my people. Now what's she saying? She's saying that edict that you signed, allowing people to rise up and kill the Jews, those are my people. I am a Jew. And Xerxes is furious. Now he's the one who signed the edict, but again, he just, like many rulers, just lets people, he's, yeah, that sounds good, go. And he realizes something is amiss, and he says, who's done this? She says, it's Haman. And the king is furious, and he rises up, and apparently he walks off for a moment, and Haman, the day has gone from bad to worse. And he throws himself down before Esther, trying to plead, but when Xerxes turns around, it looks like he is almost assaulting Esther. And he calls his guards to get him off of him. And this is another interesting thing. People like, like Haman, they may wield power. 
that they don't wield influence. Because we're told that one of the servants there just so happened to speak up as Xerxes is infuriated and wondering how he can punish the man. And someone offers the helpful suggestion. They say, well, you know, um, Haman actually built these gallows yesterday that are 75 feet tall, and they were for Mordecai, that man whom you just honored earlier today. And it just clicks like that in Xerxes' mind what to do. He says, you go hang him on it. And that's exactly what they do. And whether it was a noose or a crucifixion or impaling this man on a 75-foot stick, they hang him up there and the entire city is able to gaze upon the destruction of Haman and the reversal of of fortune. But that's not the end of the story because the Jews are still in trouble. See, Esther asks about the, the, the law and she tries to get this revoked, but Xerxes says he can't revoke it. There's the, this is the law of the land. When the signet ring is used with the king to keep the emperor from just changing laws, apparently, willy-nilly, when an edict goes out, even Xerxes cannot reverse his own edict. Kind of like Darius with Daniel in the lion's den. But they do come up with an idea. He says, what we can do. He says, you draw something up. You and Mordecai. Again, he won't do much of the work. He's just going to have them do it. He says, you draw something up, allowing the Jews to defend themselves. And so they draw up an edict, just like Haman had drawn up. And it's worded the exact same. It says, on the 13th day of the 12th month, the Jewish people are allowed to defend themselves. And they're allowed to kill any man, woman, or child that tries to harm them. And they're allowed to plunder their goods. And this is sent with all haste throughout all the kingdom. Now, I'm told that this is the third month. Now, that's fairly quick. It still gives them nine months of preparation, of information. But realize that the Jewish people for about 60 days have been living with genocide approaching. Imagine the, the fear and terror that they have experienced. And finally, however, relief comes. Well, we read about the appointed day in chapter 9, and we're told that Jews across the empire defended themselves. Not only that, but Mordecai had been given the place of Haman. He was now second in command of the, peop of, of the empire. And he grows even more influential and more powerful. We're told that officials across the, the empire fear him. And so the officials and the governors and the satraps, they began actually preparing to help the Jewish people. But there's still pockets of people, lots of people all over the country that hate the Jews and think this is going to be their opportunity. But the day comes, across the empire we're told that 75,000 enemies of the Jews were killed. In the city of Susa, 500 men were killed, including Haman's ten sons. There were still some left, and so Esther talked Xerxes into letting them go for another day, and they did. And 300 more men were killed that were enemies of the Jewish people. But something is said... Not in Susa and not throughout the empire. The Jewish people defended themselves. They killed their enemies, but they never touched the plunder. This wasn't just about wealth. This wasn't about just destroying people. But God's people were not going to be taken away. And they were allowed to be saved and they were delivered. And so when this is all done, Mordecai and Esther create a feast. They create a celebration and they call it the Feast of Purim. Now that's because of the lots. Remember the lots were called Pur. And so as kind of an homage to the way Haman tried to destroy them, they created the Feast of Purim. It is one of the most well-known feasts to this day. It's still celebrated uh, by Jewish people, even to this day, this Feast of Purim. And it's a celebration of this very event, of the salvation of the Jews and their reversal of their fortunes. And then chapter 10 is a very short chapter that just has some closing remarks about uh, Xerxes' reign and Mordecai's um, position. Now, just a couple of things that I'll go through very quickly. One, the power of example. Remember that chap, that verse back in verse 3, that these people told Haman about Mordecai because they wanted to see if his word would stand. In chapter 8, verse 17, it says, Many from the peoples of the country declared themselves Jews, for the fear of the Jews had fallen on them. What was meant to eradicate God's people actually ended up being an occasion for many Gentiles to look at the Jewish people and realize something's different about them. 
And we want to be a part of that. Now, Peter said in 1 Peter 2 verse 12, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. The world is watching you. And yes, some will hate you and some will persecute you, but some will see your faithfulness despite suffering and they'll wonder what gives you that strength. And they'll want something like that. Also, the book is a book of faithfulness. It's a faithfulness amidst pluralism. We talked about this in this culture of all these ideas. It's a book that teaches God's people to stay true to Him. If there's a more relevant message for Christians today, I don't know what it is. In our culture, our society, it's the same thing. We must be faithful to the one true God. It's faithfulness under pressure, not to conform. Faithfulness despite persecution. But of all these things, when we are faithful, it's a story of God's providence. Now, like I mentioned at the start, God is not mentioned anywhere in this book. But there sure are a lot of consequences. Vashti is dismissed. Of all the entire kingdom, Esther is selected and made queen. Mordecai just happens to overhear a plot against Xerxes and is able to use his uh, cousin to inform the king. Xerxes can't sleep on the perfect night. It just so happens that the reading reminds him of Mordecai's good yet unrewarded deed. Haman's timing of coming in right when the king is done. And Mordecai's appointment and increase led the officials to helping the Jews. There are coincidences all over this book. Because they're not coincidences. I think the absence of God is intentional. To a people dispersed across the world and no longer at home. In Jerusalem where the temple is where it may begin to feel like God has left them and deserted them. This book is a reminder he has not. He is there, and he is working, and he is faithful. And it doesn't just apply to the Jewish people. One commentator said, coincidences are not limited to the realm of God's people. Persian kings and royal officials also move and act under the unseen hand of the great sovereign Lord. What an incredible thought that is. Where is God? He is working for his people. Remember Romans 8 28 and we know that for those who love God all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. We don't have to know all of the details. We don't have to understand all of the workings behind the scenes and in the spiritual realm but we can trust that when we're faithful Despite the influence of the world, despite the pressure, despite the persecution, despite the times that it seems like God is silent and he's not here, and we look at a country that feels like it's moving further and further away from God, and we wonder what's going on. God is who he has always been. And he's just as faithful as he's always been. And he's just as powerful as he's always been. And his promises stand just as sure today as they ever have. So the book of Esther may take place a long time ago in a place far, far away, but it is a contemporary message, if ever there was one, of a call to faithfulness and to trust in God and His care and His providential protection for His people.